tell me, you know, I, I better introduce him on time. Okay, it, it's really a tremendous pleasure to introduce Torbert Rochford today. He's an endowed professor at Purdue, um, but he started it out at the, in Massachusetts, born and raised there. He's named after uh, a Harvard football player, Torbert... McDonald. McDonald. Uh, and, uh, and so then he did his undergrad at the University of Massachusetts. He then went uh, to work with the USDA and um, at the University of Maryland to do a master's in wheat breeding. And uh, at that point, he learned what a pain working with wheat is. <laughs> and uh, he then decided to go out to Nebraska and did his PhD in maize breeding there. Um, he did a postdoc with Daryl Crane down at the University of Florida, and he was working on uh, cytoplasmic male sterility. Uh, started learning a lot of the molecular side of things, got himself introduced to that. And then uh, with those two skill sets, he then moved to the University of Illinois, began his uh, academic career, and, um, and then after three years ago, moved to Purdue. And what I want to highlight is actually, Torbert wrote one of the most inspiring papers I read when I was a graduate student, uh, as we were trying to figure it out, and it was on the juiciness of sweet corn. So he got a taste panel uh, out there, and you guys are laughing, but it, you know, he was able to map people's preference for juiciness uh, of sweet corn. And when I realized that you could map something as you know, soft, as juiciness, and just ask some people, and, you know, and they said, wow, this whole genetic mapping thing, if it's well designed, it's really powerful. And you know, I think it's that type of creativity and willingness to go, you know, let the powers of genetics uh, do all sorts of exciting things is really inspiring. And then Torbert then introduced uh, myself and so, uh, the, the crowd that's surrounding uh, us here uh, um, with uh, getting into the carotenoids, and he'll give you a good justification as why. We think this is a really important area to work in. So without more ado, Robert. Cool. Well, very good. Well, it's a pleasure to be here. And I've been here for the fall. I've really been enjoying it. And I grew up in Massachusetts, so it's just been a lot of fun because I get to go over and see my 88-year-old uh, parents and, and see them and travel around. But when I first came out in August, I must say I did go through some depression driving from Worcester to Ithaca because there's not quite as much corn here as there is in Indiana and in, in Illinois. Um, but nevertheless, you, you have... <laughs> hey, your, your yields were great. Your yields were really quite good. Uh, and that was actually a highlight in my career was to go to the farm up on the lake and be touching a hybrid corn plant and seeing a lake with clear water. Because I do miss the clear water of the Northeast. We're good at muddy water in the uh, Midwest. I think, Ed, we need more perennials to take care of that. So what I'm going to do is talk about, uh, I'm going to give some of this to the grad students, have a little bit of a historical perspective. I'm going to be meeting with the grad students afterwards. And you know, scientists are people. And they work in different places, and they go to meetings, and they create things. That could be germplasm. That could be technologies. And you have convergence at certain times that leads to certain events. So I'm going to talk about how certain things happened in my career. I mean, Ed, I don't know if I could match Ed's. Like, he went into his whole research area because of the juiciness of sweet corn. Uh, that's pretty. <laughs> I don't think I can top that one. Um, but I'm going to talk about. I'm not going to talk about carotenoids first. This is really the first time I've talked about it in a formal seminar other than just a few slides saying that we've started. This is the work of Jason Morales, and it involves using X plant variety protected materials that are now available in the public sector. And a lot of the support comes from Dow, um, but also we have a plant breeding training grant at Purdue, and that helps out as well. So I'll tell you the real story. I just come back from sabbatical to John Innes in 98, and we were mapping QTL for high oil. And there was a company, since I'm being recorded, I'm not going to say who it, who it is and who they are, uh, but there was a company, and they were really interested, and they were giving a little bit of support on the QTL. And you put the map, and the QTLs are really cool. And then they said, well, we want to go see the germplasm. Well, Illinois high oil was an 1890s open pollinated variety. And we had back crossed to B73, so three quarters B73. I thought that was cool. Well, the research director says, Torbert, this is a zoo. And because the tassels were big and small and diseased. 
And then some of the breeders, they didn't say it to my face, but my grad students over here, and they were just laughing at this germplasm. And then they didn't really support the work anymore because we were so far away relative to commercial germplasm. We had maps from QTL. So I tucked that in the back of my head. And Dick Johnson, who had a very successful career at DeKalb Monsanto, and a lot of Monsanto's success is directly attributable to him getting into marker-assisted selection, essentially in a big way before anybody else on the planet, in my opinion. And uh, except maybe the Tanksley work going on in tomato, but certainly in maize. Um, he retired, and I nominated him for an adjunct. And I said, well, Dick, you want to grow some corn? Because he had been completely in primatics and, and quantitative genetics. I thought maybe 300 later, he needed like 3,000, because he, he thinks big. But I asked him, you know, I want to grow some corn that people in industry won't laugh at. So he basically took out a napkin and uh, wrote out some things. But plant variety protection, I'll go through quickly, means you can protect your germplasm. Companies started investing a lot more money into plant breeding. More PhDs were hired because they could protect it because it was kind of a very soft protection before that. You could actually sue people and do things. And it was kind of like the wild, wild west before that. However, PVP led to less investment in public sector corn breeding because everyone said, well, industry is doing it. Well, you know, a little while later we realized, well, where, do, where are the corn breeders coming from? So these lines started coming out in 94. <clears throat> and they're available. They're completely available. And what you can see is over time, more and more were protected. And then 18 to 20 years later, more and more were being released. And most of them were protected by Pioneer, who was really, really had like 40 to 49% of market share in some of this time. And Holden's had a lot of inbreds derived from public from the release line and improved. And DeKalb, which is now part of Monsanto, and Novartis, which is part of Syngenta now. So uh, this is Jason's slide. And basically, you, you have somebody that was important, and then you forget about it, but then maybe you put them into a different context, and they have a lot of value, and they work really, really well. So what we're doing is taking some of these things that at some point in time were very important and putting them together. So we've created a, a breeding population from a Holden's sediment, Holden's inbred, and a Pioneer inbred, which you could now legally cross. And um, basically, we wanted to get some higher performing lines just to provide a platform for genetic research so that it was relevant, so that the mean, instead of being here, and industry is here, it's close, it's ballpark. And, and we wanted to map QTL, and recently we've gotten into some genomic selection with this. And so my point about mean is that if you map something, a physiological trait or some trait, and you're in a background that's 150 bushels an acre, and industries are 200 bushels an acre, if you move that QTL in, it may or may not have an effect. Whereas if you're at 190 and you map it there at 200, it's much more likely going to have an effect, particularly if you get into something you want to map, uh, something that affects yield. Uh, linkage drag is an issue with, with genotype by sequencing. It may become less of an issue, but you know, that was kind of a problem with public sector. Um, and so we just didn't have really close relationships in a direct way with the, with the private sector. And so that's what this was uh, designed to address. Plus, Jason Morales, uh, he's been working. He, he has a job with Dow. He finishes up in March. And um, he was actually able to work on the germplasm that is directly relevant to what's being grown out there. These are the great grandparents of what's being grown. So we, we evaluated Dick, you know, just right off the top of his head. This is what I'd look at. And crosses of Pioneer by Holdens and, and Pioneer by DeKalb. And we had this unique opportunity to take these separate germplasm pools and bring them together and hopefully get something, something uh, that was pretty good. And so that was, uh, and these were materials like 
Pioneer had iodents and there was like germplasm that nobody, nobody had access to because it, it was like a trade secret. They just kept it. But now you could, now you could get to it. So we had seven different F23s. And for each of them, we took a random 20 and put it on a tester. So we had crossed Holden's by Pioneer. And it was a logical Holden's tester. There was a logical Pioneer tester. When you have an F23 between them, what's the better one? So we put them onto both. But I decided I wanted to sample 40 F2s instead of 20 on the same tester. Uh, and I think that was the right thing to do. And what we found, there were, there were several lines. And, oh, you know, it's really, you guys have really high, cool high tech here. And I should learn how to use it. So this is the, this is the pointer. So I can, I can, <laughs> I can reach, reach up there without. Oh, you have a bamboo pole? These are really great. I, I find these way better because I had some coffee this morning and, you know. Uh, okay. So um, this cross here on the Pioneer tester was the best, and this one here on the Holden's tester was the second best. And then this one here, which is slightly different than LH51, a little different background, these were the third and fourth best. And so we, we, took, we took this one. And we, we test crossed it on this one to start because the nick was a little bit better, and we did it on that one later. But this was what we picked from evaluating these different crosses, and it was just the highest mean performance. That's what we want. And so, yeah, I have this, now I have to use it. Um, this here was our first set with LH119. And all I want to point out is these are our experimental lines and these are commercial checks. These were the best checks, were barely been released that we could get our hands on. These weren't old hybrids that were two or three years old. I just wanted to get ballpark. Um, if we beat the commercial checks, we'd have some problems. But bear in mind, we have a 20 year old tester that we're putting our F23s onto. So the commercial hybrid has a new tester on both sides. So when you put it, onto this here is a Dow tester right here. So this was an elite tester. The performance is good. And you see this one here? And this is 167 there. And you know, this is different environments. This is 170. We had 74 experimental lines that beat that in these three environments, that DeKalb Monsanto hybrid. So we're in the ballpark. If we grew this in 60 environments, our stuff would go down. But it did what we needed. The other thing is, the PhD 39, um, we, had, we had good performance. The commercial checks came there, then ours came right after that. But, um, so I was happy. It meant we were ballpark. People were not going to laugh at my germplasm anymore. Um, so the map is Illumina with 1,500 markers. Dow did this, 470 polymorphic. That is our genotypic database, and that matters when you get into genomic selection. So what we find here is there are QTL for yields coming from Holden's and from Pioneer. So we can pyramid these. We can do breeding and commercially rele relevant levels and pyramid, pyramid them. And then for lodging, what you're getting is Pioneer and Holden's both were contributing. But I want to go back a slide. Nah, the color, the color is not so good. But you're just going to have to believe me. OK, so this here, and I don't have the testers memorized. This is LH119, OK? You have a QTL for grain yield when you test it to LH119. But when you put it on PhD39, or the Dow tester, you don't have a QTL there because the breeding for PhD39 or for Dow may have put that same allele in there or, have with, or a different allele with large additive effects. So the point is, is that the tester makes a difference. And as we go through this, what, you'll, what you will see is that when you look at the Dow tester, which is that color, whatever color that is, 
we don't have as many significant associations with the commercial tester. We don't have as many with PHD-39. Now, LH-119 is not a bad tester to have. It's like a mutant. It helps us to reveal, uh, reveal the allelic diversity that we have in it segregating that population. We don't cover it up. And we want to get to the locus. And if you want to get to the locus, you've got to have contrasting alleles. OK, so I put this one in here. What you can see is that Pioneer did a better job of keeping ear height, ear height down than Holden's did because all of the QTL for higher ear height are coming from the Holden side. And again, you, what you have are, it's the LH119 that has more significance than the other testers have, have fewer because they're, they're basically covering up that variation. So this is where it gets interesting. Well, actually, I think it's all interesting. But this is on chromosome 1. And there's a cluster here. And with LH119, we have yield QTL. We have two yield QTL. We have lodging. We have test weight. We have ear height. We have moisture. We have a whole cluster. So it's a region that independently we were working on inflorescence architecture for ear row number. And these these two studies have kind of converged, which is it's really nice when that happens. Um, because we, we try to make up these good reasons for doing inflorescence architecture. And this, this is a better reason than what, we, than what we've had so far. Um, OK, PhD 39, if you look at the last one, you have a lot of peaks here. When you go to PH 39, uh, we have fewer peaks. I'll, I'll just say we just have fewer peaks. I'm not going to talk about where the peaks are. But what's really noticeable is when you go to the Dow tester, we don't have many associations. That may partly be because we only had three environments. We have less precision and power. But what I think it is is 25 years of breeding has put alleles in that cover up the weakness there. So that was kind of interesting. So. Here, I'm switching to a totally independent project, uh, inflorescence architecture. And, and I got into this, yeah, hey, I'll, I get time, I can tell more stories. So uh, we were mapping high oil by low oil. It was our, our first QTL study. I was an assistant professor at the time. Some people didn't think QTL were real, OK? I mean, like most of the planet. So I figured if you crossed high oil by low oil, that had been divergently selected for 90 years, I increased my chances of finding a QTL. And I could publish it, and I could get tenure, OK? Because if you couldn't find it in that, you weren't going to find it in anything, you know? So um, we were mapping. We were doing RFLPs. I doubt many of you remember RFLPs. And putting 80 on 200 progeny was a lot of work. So we were out there with John Dudley, who had handled the materials for 25 years. We have our first F23. We're all probably goes, that looks like high oil, that F23. That one looks like low oil. We're like, how did you know that? Well, high oil had a big tassel, and low oil had a small tassel. It's not directly related to oil. There's linkage of an oil QTL to the increased branch number, but it just sort of happened. Um, so I had a good postdoc, Terry Berkey, and he just harvested the tassels. What was appealing to me was is that when you did oil, when you did the NIR, you put a sample in. And it would come out 6.7% oil. You take it out, you put it back in, it would be 6.6. 6. You take it back, it's 6.8. So there's some, there's some technical error variance. But when you count the number of branches, there's either 8 or 9. You count them again, if there's 8, there's 8. The only way you're going to get a wrong number is you can't count. <laughs> OK? So I think these are ordinal numbers. So I thought this would be a nice model system for mapping QTL because you could count the numbers. That's how I got into it. Um, and we've also expanded now into, I won't talk about it, into ear row number. But this is a region. This comes from NAM. This comes from this nice resource provided to the community. And this is right where our cluster is of, of all those effects in the XPVP germplasm. So genes are genes, even if they're in various backgrounds. And there's positive and negative effects. So this is the same region. And Hannah Schneider is working on this independently. 
but then what we found, and so here is her ero, ero number QTL in a HIF, a heterozygous inbred family coming from that. So it, it's very, very close to the same region. And then I was talking to Jason, and we did yield components. You know, numbers of kernels per row, number of rows per ear. And he was, he said some record, I can't use any names, but he was talking to a well-respected senior breeder. And they were like, oh, we did that. It didn't work, nothing came out of it. But he did that before we had molecular marker mapping. And they would look at it and try to model how to breed for yield or understand it with yield components, and it didn't really work. But with molecular marker mapping, you have a lot more incisive power to see what's going on. And his two parents, in this region he has ear row number, his two parents, one has more uh, ear rows, you know, that's number around the ear, and one is taller and has fewer. And we think we kind of hit a happy medium between those two contrasting traits, and that's what's contributing to some of the higher yielding ones, is that happy medium. So, so it does work. Um, and that's a function of time. So this is a region that we're going to spend a lot of time on. And this is from Hannah. This is just from her hips. And she has other traits. And she was smart because the pollination and some weren't good. And so she counts potential ear rows, not just ones where the seed set. Because if you have bad seed set, and there's supposed to be eight and only seven set, you know, that can affect you. But all I'm going to say here is there's a lot going on in this region. Okay, so this is that first slide that I showed you that's showing there's a cluster of significant traits. And I don't know why I showed it again. All right, now we're changing gears. Okay, that was supposed to be the change. All right, so now Jason wanted to go and do some genomic selection because he had mapped these QTLs. And the mapping population was 358 F23s. And test cross to LH119. But we had another 200 that we hadn't uh, made up testers. So we wanted to get into genomic selection. And so we, we sent those uh, to Chile so we could grow them. And Dow agreed to do some genotyping on those as well. So for the, the next four slides, I just got these from Jason over the weekend. And maybe you'll have some questions, but I'll you can ask me questions anytime except for these next four slides. Um, so this is, this is the observed yield, and this is the predicted yield from his model. So this is the same data set. This is 350 F23s. Here's our yield data, and this is what he predicted from his QTL analysis and developing his models. And the R square is 0.57. This is the top 10% from prediction. This is the top 10% from phenotype. You have some overlap. Uh, you can feel kind of good, maybe. Um, I don't have to go over there about those. All right, this one, you notice the R square is a little lower. OK, well, there was something that happened this past summer, was we had a brutal drought through mid-August. Then after most of the grain fill was over, we had lots of rain, but it was too late. So. This is the observed yield in those 200 new F23 families. This is the predicted yield from his model, but that's from 2010 and 2011 data that were reasonable Midwest environments. And the prediction wasn't very good, okay? So, however, Jason has a, has a different twist on this. And I don't know whether I agree with him or not, but I'm going to present it. You guys can make up your own mind. He carried some lines over from the original population as checks. And these red ones are just random lines from the 358. And here he had the best yielders and the lowest yields. But he had some random lines. And the uh, observed yield of just growing these lines uh, in 2010 and 11 versus 2012 was only 0.06. It was as bad as the genomic predictions. So it was, it was a pretty bad year. And so he kind of thought that 
maybe this is not so bad because we had such a poor year. Now the, the R squared is a little higher in the top lines and the bottom lines, but it may be this number is, this number is really no worse than predicting based on phenotype. And then if you look at these, these sets that, that he had in 2012, his predictive values, just looking at those sets, and it's a slightly different analysis, uh, the R squares were slightly higher than what you would predict on phenotype. So you make up your mind whether you think it's working or not. Um, I think it's interesting, and we're going to, what we need to do is we need to grow these in a different environment. We really need to run GBS to have a lot more power in, a, in our models and precision. Because we had 400 markers here, and these were selected just for distribution. Um, and they were changing platforms, and we couldn't run the exact same set. And so we did Casper. But they weren't picked because they were linked to QTL. They were picked for distribution. And so we'll continue with that. Um, I, think it's, I think it's encouraging, but we just have to, have to grow it some more. OK, so that's this project here uh, with XPVP. And can someone get me a drink of water? And uh, so I've worked, we've worked with Dow, a lot of people at Purdue. Dick Johnson started it all. And I've, and I've worked with uh, different people on that. And uh, I'll have to wait till Ed. Well, I'll tell the story while Ed's gone. Uh, um, so so, so uh, uh, yeah, so here's another good story, Ed is we started growing the XPVP materials. And uh, Narissa Mapadayula, who now works for Monsanto in Singapore, and Sophia De Silva, who now works for KWS in Germany. You notice those are commercial companies. So we were growing NAM out at Illinois, and we were starting the XPVP materials. And there was a brutal thunderstorm. And they go out, and this NAM stuff is most of it's blown over. And they go to the XPVP, and it's all standing up straight. And so there, there, is, there is value, just logistical value, to using X commercial material. It stands up. When you pollinate it, it sets seed. I mean, there are some nice things. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, and, and uh, those lines were select. I mean, you think about it. Those lines were used to create hybrids. And on the female side, there was a lot of strong selection uh, to set seed well. So OK, so now we'll change to carotenoids. And um, this was a project that was prompted. We had mapped the QTL to shrunken two, uh, a starch mutant. And it was a little squishy. And carotenoids was, a, was appealing to me. And this is when we were just collecting different stalks of orange from all over the world. This is from Uruguay, and this is from Mendoza. I wish I had to go there and get them myself. Um, but my reasons for working on carotenoids were two reasons. One is that uh, it was well characterized in prokaryotes and eukaryotes. There was a really nice pathway. And the other is it was nutritionally important. So those were equal, equally important reasons. And I thought this could be a model QTL system. And when I, when I got into this and started thinking about this, it was, it was summer of 92. And my first postdoc was finishing up Erwin Goldman. He was going to Wisconsin and as a faculty member. And we talked about it. And it was like you're in kindergarten. And you say, I want to get a PhD. Because one gene had been cloned at that time in the pathway. But I felt like someday we would get to most of them. And you know, there is a road map from kindergarten to PhD. But we did it faster. We did it a little faster than that. But it, it, it took a while. So those, those were the reasons for going, for going into this. Um, and carotenoids are, you know, you hear about vitamin A in the developing world. But the US population is actually deficient in xanthophils. They're not beta carotene. They're not pro vitamin A types. And macular degeneration is actually going up in the US because our diets have changed. Uh, and so there is, there is relevance uh, to, the, to the US. And for 
Uh, from a global standpoint, in the developing world is like a quarter million young children die of vitamin A deficiency every year. It's pretty, it's pretty serious. Uh, and people have night blindness and immunological deficiencies. But uh, I need to tie, relate this to Cornell. Uh, so the Y1 locus, which is white versus yellow, was characterized by Emerson here, probably out same fields McClintock worked. And uh, they didn't bother to drive all the way up the lake, I guess. And uh, they didn't need to. Um, they had high quality genetic crosses. They did genomic selection before they made crosses. They knew what they were doing. So Quackenbush, who was in the biochemistry department, and he just ran a bunch of inbreds. Uh, and with HPLC, that was like big, cool, cutting edge research at the time. And then Evelyn Weber at Illinois had run some HPLC on like about 20 contemporary public sector inbred, inbreds. And that data was floating around. She was ARS, but she had just retired when I got there, but, but colleagues knew about it. When I was writing my first proposal, a colleague read and said, well, what happened between 1960 and 1984 in this field? Nothing. Okay, nothing happened. So, but that's just the history. So the Y1 locus was cloned, and that just started, you know, that was cloned by then, and that meant you could clone carotenoid genes in maize, and it opened up a lot of possibilities. But I used her data to do our first cross, and Jeff Wong was the grad student that worked on that, and he's now out at Cal Poly, San Luis Obispo, as a professor. There's a lot of variation for flux into the carotenoid pathway. Um, as you can see here, and this one here has actually has it's it's not just flux. There's a there's a carotenoid cleavage dioxygenase that chews up carotenoids. It's a bad gene, so we we select against it. But this slide, so this is where we were. The gene it takes you from white versus yellow. It was a gain of function mutation because teosinte was white and early maize was white, but it was a gain of function transposable. They turned it on in the endosperm. So it's a, um, carotenoids in the endosperm is a luxury. Uh, the embryo and certainly the leaf is a different story. But you have colorless carotenoids. You get to lycopene. Tomatoes are full of lycopene. Corn doesn't have hardly any, unless you're Tom Brettinell and you knock out some genes. And, uh, and then the plant's sick. But um, it branches here. You have these cyclases. This is a linear molecule. And it branches here. And if the beta-beta wins, you get beta-carotene. If the epsilon cyclase and beta works, you, you get alpha-carotene. So that was a key point. And then you have hydroxylase. So you have cyclases and you have hydroxylase. But when I got into it, this was the only gene that was cloned. Um, but these had been cloned in E. coli and yeast and things like that. So it seemed plausible. But the important thing is there was a pathway to work with. You know, what's the pathway for yield? Ed, have you figured that out yet? No. 12, 40,000 genes? Yeah, well, that's too much for me. I can't count beyond 12. So this was, this was quite, quite suitable to me. OK. Um, so when I. Uh, this is a paper of Jeff Wong, and we mapped QTL to two loci. Uh, Ellie Wurzel had cloned zeta carotene to saturase uh, at, you know, while Jeff was a grad student, and we got the clone from her. So only two genes had been cloned, and, but those two both mapped to QTL. So this was kind of encouraging. And Jeff finished up in like 2001, 2002, and plant genome kind of kicked in in 99, about something like that. Uh, so this, these were done the hard way, those, those genes. Uh, and, and so but what I want you to think about is NSF genome has really impacted the sort of questions and what results we can get. So I, Jeff was finishing up, and Gerard Barry was with Monsanto now. He's now at Erie. And, but he was in charge of their, of their technologies they give away to the developing world. And he had close relationships with the US AID. And I went up to him 
after his talk, and he had carotenoids over on the corner. And I, and I said, well, we worked on carotenoids. And he s said he was kind of involved in advising. I said, well, we'll send you Jeff's thesis. Happy to come down to St. Louis and just tell you what we learned. You know, and then like three weeks, no, not three weeks, three months later out of the blue, he says, hey, we got a project with USAID. Can I get a proposal in the next three days? And um, I didn't make it, but I got it done in a week. Um, and I was, did this ever happen to you? Did you ever win a race? Ah, you won a race. Well, what was, what was the race that you won? Um, yeah, it was, it was with uh, like baseball. Baseball. Yeah. You, well, it was, okay, so it was like t-ball. T-ball. And I was the only girl in my age group, so I got to go to that next level because I was the only girl in that age group. So. See, it happens. So I was, I was asked to get involved with a USAID project for carotenoids for Africa because I was the world's authority on QTL and carotenoids and maize at the time because we had done one biparental mapping population. <laughs> <laughs> I was also the only person in the world working on it at the time, so I won the race because I was the only one. Uh, so. It's fine, but I actually, Gerard was struck by the fact that I came up to him and I just offered to help uh, with it. So then, then this, this talk by this, this guy, Ed Buckler, 2000 or 99, and he's talking about association analysis. And I think it was Sunday morning, and there was, see, I'm being recorded, I can't name. It was a younger, well-respected maize geneticist. Ed gives his talk. He says, you can't do that. It's not going to work. You can't just sequence genes and some random lines. But I was sitting there knowing we had Y1 and ZDS and some other candidates. And I was on the other microphone, and I was like, right on it. This is really cool. And so then I screw his big panel of 100 lines the next year. <laughs> Little did I know that my cold rooms and store rooms, after hooking up with Ed, would come to overflow massively. <laughs> OK. All right, so we got into that, and I'm going to move along. But from the diversity panel, we can make crosses of, of different materials and see what happens. And we have this line here that was high in percent beta carotene. And we had this line that was high in total carotenoids. And I wanted to see if you could cross this. This was like 70% beta carotene. Could you cross this percent effect onto this and increase beta carotene? And we could. So that was cool. But over here, so the zeaxanthin is after beta carotene, and that could go down and, and just stop at beta carotene. That, that would make sense. But this lutein, it just disappeared. Some of it just disappeared. Where did it go? Well, it turns out, remember I talked about that carotenoid cleavage dioxygenase? It was in there. And so this had this very unique allele for beta carotene. It also had this very unique allele for chewing up carotenoids. And it just happened. But when you go and you look at diversity, you can find some of these interesting combinations. So yeah, it's a cool model system because it's so precise. And going from beta carotene, which has two provitamin A structures here, and here, to beta crypto, which has one, it's just a hydroxyl event. You just add that hydroxyl, it changes it. It doesn't sit in membranes, pores, whatever, in the same way. And so it is not a provitamin A structure. So that's cool. That's really precise. But means you have to do HPLC, which is a pain. And it's, it's like not um, the sort of thing breeders are going to do in their backyard while they're wanting to breed for the trait. So uh, here, so this is when I started hanging out with Ed. And I remember Ed, you said, you know, we could spend a million dollars. This is like in 2001 or two, a million dollars, which is like 10 million now, and just do HPLC and get to the genes, and then we do PCR. It's cheaper, you know, and that's kind of, kind of what we've done. Not exactly. I think we spent more than that, but. <laughs> uh, but that was the idea, and we had QTL, we had, we had candidate genes, and we went into association analysis with candidate genes. It's not GWAS, it's like, like Carlos Hargis had to do PCR on this gene or that gene. But I wanted to get to the genes in part because I don't really understand recombination, so if you have the gene, you're, it's a lot easier. Um, and 
technology, you know, we had these big QTL intervals with all this linkage drag. If you could just go to the gene, it's like going straight to wireless and skipping over landlines. So that was, that was the motivation. And we had this pathway and critical points were here because if you had a weak epsilon cyclase, you get more this way. And if you had a weak hydroxylase, it stops there. So that's where Carlos looked. You know, this was a big project. It was both kind of like side projects for us. I had a grad student that did some HPLC, and Carlos had had some ARS money, and that was it. And what we found was the lycopene epsilon cyclase was in a key location, and you get more with a weak one, with a weak allele, you get more to the, to the beta side. And the beta carotene hydroxylase um, was also key, because if it stops there, you get more beta carotene and less beta cryptoxanthin. So this is a summary slide, and I used to say maybe, maybe this is the functional polymorphism, but I'm not going to say that today after talking with my colleagues the next few days. But we definitely have relationships with small transposons and transcript levels that correlate with, with the logical effect of the, of the gene, and Carlos did this, did this work. He was the lead author. And Carlos also discovered the hydroxylase, but then he got a job with Monsanto, and other people uh, followed up on it. And it's similar. You have these transposable elements that are affecting expression in a way. We've learned some interesting things about enzyme activity, that there are some alleles that actually have higher enzyme activity, but if you transcribe them 77 times lower than the other allele, you don't have much message, you don't have much activity. Um, so it, it's, and we're actually coming back to this now in a different way, and so that's kind of in our genome project. And, and so from this work, uh, I had interacted with Dean on Harvest Plus, and Dean and Ed and, and Mike Gore uh, and Robin Buell, we have a carotenoid to cough oil grant uh, going from that. Okay, and so, to the last five minutes is how have we applied this. So for dark orange, I always told the breeders at Simmons, select for dark orange, select for flux into the pathway, and you can do that visually. And then the epsilon cyclase is our steering wheel, move it over to this side of the branch. And the weakest allele is the brake, but you're literally putting a brake on with one foot and a gas pedal with the other foot. So it's always orange, but you're, you're stopping it at the same, same time. And, and that's how it is. And uh, so we want flux into the pathway. We want it to go to this side, and we want to stop it here. So that's the power of a pathway. You can come up with a plan. Um, so Kathy Candianis was a grad student. She's now postdocs with Mike Grusak, who's ARS at Baylor Medical School, and uh, is it Baylor? Yeah, okay. And this is what you had for diversity, and most, most hybrids that you grow have one to two beta provitamin A, okay? Now the orange flints came out of the diversity panel, the KUIs from Thailand, and the advanced cement breeding lines, they were you doing HPLC and using what they had, but our target, we had to get to 15 before the donors got bored, okay? And Harvest Plus got funded by Gates, and so we had, we had an AID melded into that. So this is where we were, six to eight was the, was the best things. Well, Kathy did allele-specific selection. And these, this one right here, this was like CI7, which is like 50, 60 years old. This was released, you know, do you know that ARS used to be where the Pentagon is right now? That's where the farm was. That's where that was released, so it's been a while. With marker-assisted selection, we were able to get here and get up to 22, and she did this all in the greenhouse with chipping and every single plant, we knew what it was. So the strategy is you select for orange, weak leaky, weak hydroxylase, and we surpass the target, and now CIMIT has gone even further They've gotten values up in the 30s, and, and you see here and here. But there's something very interesting going on, I think. So it must be interesting. So 
you have this line 297, you add crit RB1, it only goes up to 15. Now, five years ago, we would have said awesome. Um, Florida A, it only goes up to 10. But if you have this KUI background, that's from, that's these orange materials from Thailand, it goes up to 35, 29, 32. This one is interesting. I want to cross this one by this one to find out, because these are not back cross. This was, they just crossed in a donor. They had the crit RB1 and material from Nigeria, but it was actually three quarters KUI germplasm just by, just by chance. I had told the breeders before we knew about crit RB1, select for orange. So they crossed a donor, DE3, that had the high beta carotene. I told them select for orange. And I bet they had 400 lines and he had a limited crit RB1 in 399 of them because he's select for orange. But then we had one and it was an elite background and that's what they used, but they just crossed it in self. So there's something going on here because these are identical. These are slightly different. These are actually very, very similar families for materials that I sent to Kevin. So we want to study that, but I'm really interested in what's going on with KUI. Why do we get these higher levels in that background? It was selected for orange. The inbreds I got were orange, and then I selected them some more for orange. Uh, we're going to have to go in and carefully look at total carotenoids and see what's, see what's happening there. And then a paper from Simbit just came out that at these higher levels, we may not even need leaky. So we're at like a different, it's the opposite. With yield, you know, if you're too low, Maybe your work isn't relevant. Well, maybe if you're too high, some of your work becomes irrelevant. So uh, you have to pay attention to what is the best allele in your selection, depending upon the mean of your trait. So this here is, uh, okay, who knows where this is? You, you, were, you were good at telling stories about playing baseball. Do you know where that is? Anyone else want to guess? Wrong. That's Maputo, Mozambique. And this is an ag economist, and he got in the picture because he had a Chicago hat, and this is my son who videographed it. And I don't have time to show the, the movie, but we did an acceptance study about white Shima versus orange Shima. And there have been statistical studies to show that people will eat orange because they, they don't like yellow, there's a lack of preference. But the best story is in Zambia, they're, they're working on acceptance, and they, they uh, had a, a field day, and they had all these uh, hybrids, and the country manager brought enough ground orange corn to make Shima for 100 people. And he comes, and they, he only expected 70. White Shima, white Shima, white Shima. One plate of orange Shima for the politician and dignitaries. He goes, what happened? And the women working there said, we heard it had vitamins. So we took it home and fed it to our children. So I don't need statistics. I don't need statistics. And, and it is working. So real quick, you can, so that's just, you know, they don't like this. They eat this. They haven't seen this. So you can come in with learning on it. So here you can select for orange. Breeders in developing countries can get involved without markers. Kristen Chandler, uh, she basically used 10 families of NAM and scored them visually. I doubt there are many people on this planet that could do it as well as her. I certainly couldn't. We wanted to know, can you just score for orange and map QTL? And she did 10 sets of rills. And this has just come out. And Mike Gore is the senior author. Where's Mike? There he is. Mike's going to be faculty here. I think we should welcome Mike to Cornell. <laughs> I, I had fun yesterday when Mike showed up. I said, Mike, welcome to Cornell. So I, <laughs> anyway, but, you know, but Ed, the guys from, Afri uh, from India and Mexico, so do you work here? And I had to tell him, no, I don't work here. I'm just visiting. All right, long story short is loci in the pathway are what's affecting color. And we also have uh, Z ZDS and ZEP. We have other genes in the pathway, so we have six loci that are affecting color and explaining a lot of the variation. And so my last slide is this, is we're getting in, starting to get involved with commercial hybrids that yield well and to convert them. And with six loci, we can convert white high-yielding hybrids 
to orange high provitamin A hybrids. And we want to get involved with genomic selection and run it through double haploids. Uh, and and that's, that's what I want to be spending a lot of time on the next five years. And I'll go in two years to Africa for a significant amount of time. And so to give credits, uh, this was my first grant. It was $150,000, and we no cost extended it for two years because Jeff Wong had gotten a uh, fellowship. Graduate fellowships are really important. We couldn't have done it without it. And then I got funding from USAID, and then I won the heat where nobody else entered and got, got, got money there. And then I led the National Science Foundation. Pioneer has contributed some genotyping, grad assistantship. I work with people at CIMIT and IITA. Ed and Tom, and there's been a series of grad students and many, many other good souls that have contributed to this work. Uh, I did too, thank you. <laughs> You're a good audience. I mean, this setup is good. You can come and. Well, so a, a real, you know, this is a really good question, and I get questions kind of like this, not exactly like that. Um, the, the regulation in the endosperm, we have tissue-specific regulation, and we periodically check what's happening in the roots or in the leaves, like Tom Buttonell did some of that in our work, because people will say, hey, you're messing with the carotenoids. Are you going to affect vivipary and germination? And there's other things. So uh, my answer is I don't think we're messing with it. Um, and all these programs go through, through breeding. It's a good question, and we, we need to be aware of it. But I don't think it's going to be a problem. Thank you. Yep. So, yeah, I didn't show the, the, actually the first three hybrids were released in November and are being grown. They're pre leaky crit RB1, so they're at these six to eight intermediate values, but we're using them for con consumer acceptance and awareness. Um, there are materials a little further back in the pipeline, but they've decided to, instead of, uh, they're going to skip over phase two and go to phase three and grow them in a lot of places so they can get them in. So the, it's starting in Zambia, and there logically is going to be an expansion to Malawi and Zimbabwe. And that's the cool thing about markers, is you can move the same things into different ones. So my question is, so what kind of expectation do you have on the people when you select those six genes from the transplants? Expectation in what way? Um, let's say the carotenoid levels, monotypic carotenoid levels. 25? No reason why we can't get 25. You know, I mean, I'm comfortable with 25, and the target level is 15. Uh, whether we can get more than that, maybe, but I'm very comfortable with 25. In two back cross with recovery with GBS, and then selfing, and then doing test crossing with GBS to select for yield, be pretty cool. Yes. Do you, do you see much problem when converting in a white maize background in terms of AP studies? So. Excuse me, s'il vous plaît. When you back when you background those orange allele in white background, do you see epistasis or strange result or just behave? So, nicely? so okay. So it's a good question. You have a white background, and and it's it. There's actually variation in the white background that we just don't know about because we we haven't looked at. It. But the why locus is a knockout and so you either have yellow or white okay so we have to go from white to yellow with Y and like in the Midwest they have high yielding whites and high yielding yellows because there's like a white industry because did you know that Frito buys white corn because if you if you put all that grease on yellow corn it looks burnt 
So you, they're depriving you of nutrients. You should just know that. Okay. So, so that's, that, that's uh, common. And then these, these other loci, they're just variants that we're pyramiding. But I'll, I will say this thing where maybe we don't need leaky at the high level. We've never been at these levels before. So we're, we're learning. But no, it's, it's not a problem. Okay. Well, if you have more questions, they can torvert around. Yeah, I'm, uh, so. yeah, I'm here through the 13th of December, well, but I'm going to California, Denver, New York, and Worcester for, for Thanksgiving. <laughs> I'm starting tomorrow. But I'm around to the 13th. But I'm meeting with the grad students, I think, for lunch. I hope. I didn't eat lunch. <laughs> <laughs>